Kutztown University Radio here on this call with uh, three special guests today, uh, Vice President for Enrollment Management and Student Affairs, Dr. Warren Hilton, Associate Dean for Inclusion and Outreach, Jerry Shearer, and Dean of Students, Dr. Donovan McCargo. Gentlemen, I want to thank you all so much for being here with me on this call today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Mike. All right, so we're just about getting into a very, uh, well, we're getting into a new semester, of course, and uh, this is a very unique semester because it seems that uh, in the past uh, six months or so, you could say that a lot has changed in our, in our world and our, and our country. So uh, while it's, it's a very exciting semester, it's also a semester with some, you know, uh, new issues and, and uh, considerations that we have coming up. Uh, briefly, before I get into uh, a slightly different topic here, just wanted to touch briefly on, um, you know, students are coming back uh, into a uh, new world with lots of new health and wellness protocols uh, to keep, uh, keep them safe uh, with, uh, with COVID. Um, I've talked to some other people on some other calls about those particular issues, but just wanted to get it out there and hear it from, from you gentlemen as well, too. Uh, just any advice that any of you gentlemen might have, and any of you can jump in here uh, with students starting the semester, uh, you know, with, uh, with this new normal that we now live in. So I don't know who wants to take that question, but feel free to take it away. Well, certainly, and thank you, Mike, for coordinating this. Uh, COVID-19 has affected us all in different ways. Uh, what we have seen over the last you know, five, six months has, has been um, tragic in some instances and inspiring in others. So I have been inspired by our students and their families, the resilience that they have shown uh, in, you know, taking their classes online, uh, some families suffering through uh, the loss of loved ones as well as loss of jobs. And uh, it's impressive, some of the, the encouragement and emails and social media posts that I've seen from our students um, has been very encouraging because they, they have persisted. Uh, so the university has put in place, uh, as you said, the individuals you talked to, I'm sure they have gone over it, uh, protocols and procedures in place to mitigate the spread of the virus. Uh, in our division, uh, certainly we want to talk about our students living on campus and uh, making sure that uh, they're wearing masks uh, in all the areas, that they're following all the, the conduct rules for our students living off campus. Uh, very much the same whether you're living in the borough or living at home with your family, uh, just to stay safe, follow the rules. And, you know, the one thing I can say is continue to read the updates that the university is putting out there because uh, things are fluid and things change. The guidance from health professionals um, has, is being updated as they get new information. So um, I, I would ask that students just stay abreast and, and Pay attention to the emails and the announcements that the university is making. Very good. Dr. McCargo, do you want to jump in a little bit on that as well? Sure. And I think um, Dr. Hilton really sort of hit a home run. I think the most important thing for our students is to remember to check their communications. Um, and I think to add to that is ask for help. Um, we recognize that this could be a difficult time for a lot of people, as Dr. Hilton alluded to, um, for different reasons. Um, and when we think about the mental health and wellness of our students, I think it's important for them to remember that there are campus resources that are available to them, um, that they should reach out for help. Uh, we have student assistance, which works really closely with our office and the Office of the Dean of Students in Stratton 119. Um, but also there's some online resources as well through the Counseling and Psychological Services Department. So if students can go to uh, the, count the CPS website, Counseling and Psychological Services web website off of our main website, um, there is a ton of resources that are available both um, virtually. Um, they can also schedule appointments with a counselor as well. Um, and also for students who, who might be struggling with other financial constraints in their personal life, we do have um, some emergency funds that students can apply for, um, as well as a food pantry service through um, Friend Incorporated, which is one of our partners. And so all together, I think under the leadership of, of Dr. Hilton and the vice president, um, we are dedicated to helping our students survive um, and thrive in this environment, albeit difficult and challenging, and making sure that those resources are available. That's his, his charge to us, is making sure that we remain accessible, available to our students, 
um, and trying our best to make sure those resources that we oversee are more accessible to our students both on and off campus. And so uh, we hope that our students use them, but again, um, they have to ask for help. We don't always know what the needs are, um, but if they let us know, we will try to be as responsive as we can. I think that's a good point, uh, Dr. Bacargo uh, and Dr. Hilton. You, you got to ask. You got to ask for help. You know, you, you can't just uh, assume that somebody knows what you're thinking and what what your issues are. You've got to ask for that help. So then, and you've got that help and and the resources there. So, um, Jerry, uh, I don't know if, if you wanted to just jump in a little bit on that particular topic before we get into our next topic. Feel free. Sure. Uh, just in addition to following all the guidelines, is is be healthy yourself. I mean, you know. It's, it's a mysterious, not mysterious, not total mysterious, but we all know everything about the, about the COVID. But we know that if you take care of yourself, just keep yourself as healthy as possible, get some sleep, you know, extra vitamin C, just, you know, eat, eating eating better. Uh, if you're healthier, maybe, maybe hopefully, less chance of, 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 of you getting sick uh, from COVID. So take care of yourselves as students, staff, and faculty. Uh, and I've been trying to do that myself. Um, and um, don't forget, we are part of downtown Kutztown. Uh, Email came out today, joint letter from the president and the, and the mayor. I saw that. Uh, I'm involved with things downtown as well. Good stuff. Okay. Gentlemen, I, I want to change the subject a little bit. I said at the beginning of, of the interview here that uh, a lot has, has changed and happened in our country in the past six or so months and uh, kind of, you know, two big things happening at the same time. You know, we had COVID and then uh, May, I believe it was, um, uh, we had, the, of course, the, uh, the horrific um, incident with uh, Mr. George Floyd and that just spawned a whole bunch of uh, conversation and, 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 and interesting, uh, you know, thought uh, regarding uh, diversity and, and how, you know, racism in our country and systemic racism, et cetera. Uh, students have been, you know, exposed and seeing a lot of the, what's going on in the media and such. Uh, gentlemen, uh, diversity initiatives that are being expanded and put in place as a result of these national events uh, earlier this summer, um, uh, what, 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 what comments do you have on that? What, what is Kutztown University uh, doing to help students uh, cope with that and, and to uh, provide a resource for them if, if, they, if they need somebody? I uh, want to take that one first, kind of a big question, so. Sure, so maybe I'll provide maybe an overarching kind of answer and okay. then, you know, Donovan and Jerry can dig a little bit deeper. Sure. Um, so certainly seeing you know, the horrific tragedy related to George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor, uh, Maude Aubrey, uh, it, it was a lot for all of us to take in. Uh, that trauma that we saw kind of play out on our screens, whether it be on our TVs or our mobile devices and such, um, it, it really hit home for a lot of people, uh, no matter what uh, race, religion, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, uh, no matter who you are, it, it really hit home for a lot of people. And certainly our faculty, staff, and students and alumni were no different. Uh, so after the incident with George Floyd, uh, we did uh, put together some listening sessions that I believe Jerry can talk uh, about more in detail. Um, to hear how people were feeling first uh, before, you know, trying to take some action. We, we really wanted to hear from people, hear what their feelings were, get the pulse, understand what they needed, um, and, and then move forward from there. Again, it was very in inspiring for me to hear our faculty, staff, and students and alumni saying, you know, overall, the university is, is not a bad place, but there's things that uh, maybe we can improve on. And so we heard what those things were. We then, uh, within the Enrollment Management and Student Affairs Division, we tasked all of our departments to think about how we can uh, expand on what we're doing related to uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, we asked folks to put forward action items uh, other divisions, uh, academic affairs, uh, administration and finance, social equity and compliance, uh, university relations and athletics, and so on and so forth, were all did very similar things. And it came together with a list of action items, over 100 action items that were released to the university that are a starting point for the university 
uh, starting from all the good work that had, has taken place up until this point, uh, and then trying to move the university uh, forward as, uh, you know, looking at uh, moving beyond, uh, if you will, not just, you know, not being racist to being anti-racist and starting to get at some of the systemic uh, things that are structural in our system of education and certainly our system of higher education. So that's the journey that we're on. Uh, my goal is that uh, eventually it will just be a part of the DNA of our university. I'd love to look back, you know, five, 10 years from now and uh, having discussions around justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion are just a normal thing. Uh, they happen all the time at the university. Uh, to see uh, greater uh, inclusion and diversity, um, you know, around race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, uh, religion, all of those things. I mean, because we are more than just one thing, right? Um, there's this concept of intersectionality. So um, I'm very proud to work at a university that is uh, willing to take a look at itself. And uh, even though we weren't bad, um, to look at itself, we were probably pretty good. Uh, but to take a look at itself and say, you know what, there's a lot more that we could do. Uh, the last thing I'll say in the, in the wake of, uh, you know, losing two civil rights leaders um, back to back, uh, yeah. C.P. Vivian uh, and John Lewis, uh, I think it underscores the need for us to educate the next generation of civil rights and justice, social uh, justice uh, leaders. And I think uh, that is one of the tasks that we have at the university. So. Uh, to, to, to create that next John Lewis that could potentially come out of Kutztown or C.T. Vivian. So uh, I didn't want to uh, go without uh, mentioning those two individuals' names and our commitment to educating our students um, of all races, ethnicities, religious background, political affiliations around the importance of uh, holding all humankind up uh, and, and holding it all in, in esteem. So uh, certainly uh, appreciate the question, but I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Yeah, I think you hit that one out of the park, Dr. Hilton. And like you said, this is a learning experience for all of us. Um, Dr. McCargo, do you want to throw some uh, comments in here? Yeah, I'll be quick. Um, you know, one of the things that people have said in the wake of particularly Mr. George, George Floyd's death is what can I do? Right. Um, and I think this list of these initiatives are what we are going to do. It's a response to the question of what are we going to do? We are doing things. Um, and I think this is our form of activism. It's taking the initiative to do these things that we feel are important that are going to be transformative for our students, transformative for our community, um, and transformative for us as individuals that we're going to be held accountable to get these things done. Um, we need to take this work seriously and not just check a box, but really think deeply about the impact the work is going to, is going to have on our community in particular, particularly our students. They are the future and they are the, the future John Lewis's of the world. And we have an obligation to prepare them to understand the importance of race relations, um, equality, um, and justice in our society and hopefully that they can take this on and begin a new generation of, of activism, um, of, of folks who understand the need to respect one another, um, regardless of race, um, gender, sex, um, or sexual orientation, um, religious beliefs or ideologies that we all have this sense of respect for one another, um, no matter where we work and no matter where we live. And I think looking at the list, um, like I said before, it, it is a symbol of activism to say as an institution, this is what we stand for. And these are the changes we're committed to making. Um, and a lot of the changes are deeply rooted as well. Um, they look as if they're just sort of things that we can get done right away, but they're instrumental in changing the fabric of this institution as well. And so I'm excited about it as well. There's a, it's a heavy lift, mm -hmm. um, but there's been a long time coming. And I think when there's been this much of a gap in our society for this long, any forward momentum or any forward action is gonna be a heavy lift. And um, I think we're prepared under the leadership of our institution and administration um, to carry it out. And I think that's what I'm excited about most importantly. Um, and as a parent, um, 
I'm excited as, as well um, mm -hmm. to help educate my own kids and hopefully they can educate their peers uh, who may look different than them or have a different background than they do um, to also grow up and to recognize that though we may be looked at, we may look different, um, we have an obligation to do things that are respectful and uphold and um, appreciate one another as well. So um, that's all I have for right now. Yeah, um, excellent. You hit it out of the park as well, Doug. Dr. McCargo. Um, Mr. Jerry Shearer, um, you're the Associate Dean for Inclusion and Outreach here at KU, so you, uh, this, th these topics are, are your entire life, uh, pretty much. So uh, talk a little bit about, you know, uh, what, what's going on in your office and how you're preparing to help students uh, confront some of these issues and such as we come back to this, uh, to school in, the, in a, a few days. Sure, thank you, Mike. Uh, well, again, one of the reasons I came here even 12 years ago and looking at looking at different jobs was even then Kutztown's commitment to diversity and, and part of its mission statement. And we have programs in place since then. Uh, you know, we had our, our inclusion centers, women's center, LGBTQ resource center, uh, our multicultural center, with our Fair Douglas Institute, uh, Commission on Human Diversity, Commission on Women's uh, Status of Women, Commission on Status of Minorities. You know, we've, we've been working at this for a while. Um, and we continue to work through those things. And what, what, what this did was say, hey, maybe we need to accelerate some things and what are some things we can do? And so while we continue to serve students and faculty and staff through all those things we've already had, mm -hmm. this kind of puts some of those things un, under, uh, you know, take a, a closer look at what else can we do? What else are we missing? Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is the list of first hundred. Once these are done, there'll be another hundred list of hundred or so to go. Right. Like right. It's, it's ongoing work. And, and what we do now might change in 10 years, uh, in five years. Um, so we continue to serve students and, and students are gonna come up with new ideas. Uh, we got you know, some emails already from students. Hey, what about this? What about this? Uh, once, you know, even after the list came out, like we talked to lots of people to make, it, make that list happen. Um, thanks to the leadership of, of uh, Dr. Hilton and the cabinet. Uh, but then once we put the list out, more people had ideas and that'll continue to be added to. Um, and doesn't mean those new ideas have to wait till the first hundred are done. It might just be things that we don't we do uh, in our individual offices. Um, so and I think part of it also is not just institutionally, but us as faculty and staff taking a look at us. You know, look at our office. Are we welcoming? Are we open to students? And, and are we showing our commitment to diversity in what we what we do, what we say, uh, what we wear, uh, things like that? Yeah, no, I I think you hit that out of the park as well too, uh, Jerry. I mean, it's it's definitely been a learning experience for me, my family, my students. I mean, you now see things differently and look at things differently and just, wow, I never thought of things that way. I never thought saying something this way or, or uh, conveying this sort of message would mean that. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely uh, something that has, has all watched us, uh, made us grow as part of that. Uh, on, a, on a personal uh, type uh, level, any advice that you would have um, uh, for students who, you know, maybe they've had what they believe is a, a, a case of discrimination that has been uh, waged against them, uh, who can they turn to? I mean, sometimes you're, when something like that happens, it's a, a horribly overwhelming type thing. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this just happened. Who, who can I turn to? Where can I go to? W what do you gentlemen have, uh, what advice would you have for somebody like that? I don't know who, wanna take, who wants to take that question. I think the hardest thing, uh, Mike, to be honest, and this is, I think, a, a, it, this is where transformation occurs, is that a, a person needs to speak up. Um, right. They need to, uh, and that's sort of step one, and I'll get to where, the, the where is next, but okay. the hardest thing for folks is to say something. Uh, most, most folks, at least from list, pro being part of listening sessions, um, students have had or individuals have had experiences that they've never shared, um, they never said anything about whether that be for re fear of retribution or retaliation um, or some other impact on their lives or their beings that they're just like, I don't feel comfortable or I don't know what I should do. Um, we want to encourage folks to say things, say something, you know, um, talk to someone else about it first if they just want to kind of share their opinion. Um, but as an institution, um, we have the Bias Response Task Force. Um, our website is located on the university's website. You can Google it from the university's main webpage. You can just put in bias response. Mm -hmm. It'll pop up. Um, but you can also go to the Office of the Dean of Students web, web page as well. And it's a link on, the, um, on our page to the bias response task force. And it outlines sort of the reporting protocols as well as where to report an incident. 
Um, but oftentimes we will hear individuals say, this happened and no one did anything. And then we will say back in return, well, who did you tell? Or where did you report this? And they say, oh, I didn't report it because I didn't think anything was going to happen. Right. We want to demystify that idea or that myth, so to speak, of nothing's going to happen. We have to first find out. And um, I can speak from the bias response task force and the fact that when we receive information, there is a protocol in place to respond, including the follow up with the individual making the report. Um, we take those things very seriously. Um, if they reach a level of um, a conduct or a violation of our student code of conduct, it will be transferred over to our student code, our student conduct office. Mm -hmm. um, if it reaches a level of harassment, discrimination, it reaches our office of social equity. And so, and if there is a true crime, um, a hate crime, that's forwarded over to our police department here on campus. And so there are mechanisms and processes in place to respond to and to, re to receive reports. Um, we just want to encourage people to, to, to be mindful of that and that we want to hear them. Um, this is a safe place. We, we do value um, their voice. We value um, what affects them. And we want to be responsive to those things so that they feel more welcome in our community. And so um, that's, I guess, for me, the most important thing is say something. Say something, say something, so that we will know. Um, because what we also, and as, as a final point, one of the things that I've I've observed is sometimes um, a student or an individual may be impacted by an incident or an offense that if they don't report may be habitual. It will become habitual, meaning that same thing that they experience will on someone else will make me experience it as well. And no one says anything about it. So we will never ever be able to address it. Um, so I think it's important to not um, sit on that information to bring, come forth, share it, report it. And, um, let us do our best to, to support the students or individuals who are impacted. Is there a tool in place, like if a student wanted to remain anonymous with their reports, is, is that something that's possible? Sure, we do, we do talk to individuals and the, the training that we provide out of our office um, and pr pr primarily is what I, I, I talk to individuals about is, if you desire to report anonymously, there, there are some challenges with right. addressing a particular incident, right? If there's another individual involved and that in individual is close with you or maybe someone in your right. residence hall or community member, if, if you're reporting anonymously, it may, be, it may make it more difficult to provide that follow-up and remediation to that situation or reconciliation. So we don't discourage anonymous reporting. We, it is allowed, um, mm -hmm. but we do share with those who are reporting that, hey, here is something to think about as an anonymous reporter. I just don't want folks to walk away and say, now I reported and nothing happened. Well, if you reported it anonymously and depending on the incident, um, then we may have limitations on how we're able to respond to that situation. Right, makes perfect sense. Dr. Hilton, uh, uh, Jerry, did you want to uh, uh, toss any uh, thoughts into into the whole reporting process and speaking up, sort of, you know, that comfort level? Sure. Just and you know, there are some things that, that definitely rise to that bias. You know, an incident actually happens, uh, but there are other things people might just be feeling a certain way, or um, and so in that case, maybe not. You know, just finding someone they trust on campus, and I would hope uh, that all students, even our freshmen, you know, have a connection with someone on campus. And I believe that every faculty and staff here would be, you know, help that student, you know, get them the right resources, um, uh, you know, whether through our counseling center or just someone to talk to. Uh, taking, as I mentioned before, you know, taking care of your physical health, well, in this case, also taking care of your, your own mental and emotional health, um, you know, just by talking to someone, how, you know, how you're feeling. If it's more of a program question, you know, someone that wants to express something with programming, or just a concern is also for students, the diversity council that they can go to, which is a, a subgroup of our student government uh, association. So there's there's all kinds of ways, you know, the official bias task force is, is great for uh, an incident that happened, but there's also individual to talk to student government groups um, that also can reach out and help as well. Good, and Dr. Hilton, did you want to yeah, say? Yeah, I, I think they summed it up really well. The only thing I'll add to that um, to, to further accentuate uh, Dr. McCargo's point about even if the incident didn't happen to you, speak up, mm. right? So you witnessed something. Um, Good point. It's okay for you to speak up on, on behalf of that person or in support of the person who experienced the bias um, and to, to also be a part of that reporting process. Um, so I would encourage people who are quote unquote bystanders 
uh, to actively engage and, and participate uh, in, in this uh, conversation. One of the most powerful things that we saw amid all of the uh, protests uh, and activism in the streets was it was just not black and brown people who were out there outraged. Uh, it was white people. Uh, it was uh, some of our Asian uh, partners and colleagues and brothers and sisters who, who were out there as well saying, yes, it didn't happen to me, but I'm out here supporting you and I'm out here fighting on your behalf. And uh, I think uh, that was one of the most powerful things for me. And I think that's one of the things that as, as all of us see bias on campus, it, it may, even if it doesn't happen to you, um, speak out um, and speak to that situation and, and report it if you have to. Excellent, excellent. Gentlemen, I know you're all very busy. I wanna end on a, a, a lighthearted note here. I, Final thoughts for, you know, advice or one one paragraph or one sentence or uh, one thought that you want to get out to the current class coming into Christown University this fall. I don't know who wants to take that one first. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I, I'll, I'll take a stab because uh, we were just, our student success team was just discussing this. Uh, our student success team is a number of leaders on campus who are, in the team is designed to help reduce barriers for students, get get the word out to students and do things that will help students be successful. So we were just talking about this uh, about an hour ago. One of the biggest challenges to student success is going to class. We know that students who go to class, who attend class and actively participate in class, historically do better in those classes. That will be uh, an even bigger challenge during this current semester right. because of COVID-19 and many of the classes being either hybrid or online. It is critical, students, hear me when I tell you, it is <laughs> critical that you go to your classes, whether they be online or in person, that you actively engage if the, if the professor is using DT D2L for discussion and things of that nature, it is going to be more critical than ever that you participate in every single class that you can. The virtual technology is great. It's, it's making it possible that even if you're not feeling well that day and you have your online class, you don't even have to leave your room, the comforts of your own bed if you don't wanna leave your bed to attend class. So set your alarm clocks, uh, set reminders, put your class schedule on your calendar, put your assignments on your calendar, and go to every single class that you can make. So that, that would be my one biggest piece of advice for our uh, students. So in three words right there, go to class. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Even if it's online, go to it. So. That's right. Dr. Ricargo, what's your uh, advice, thoughts, whatever, words of inspiration? Uh, I think it's it's simple. Um, take care of yourself and others. Yeah. Um, we're in a season right now that if we don't take care of ourselves and others, we are going to be in trouble. Um, yep. Wearing a mask is paramount. You know, following the safety protocols are paramount. Don't take for granted why the why these things are in place. Right. Don't fall into this mindset of these things being a hoax. Mm -hmm. um, I, I honestly feel like we have nothing to lose by being careful. We have everything right. to gain. And, and when I hear people say it doesn't make sense, it's stupid. You have nothing to lose. You have everything to gain by being safe. Um, and I think, too, to Jerry's point earlier, is just taking care of yourself, your mental health. Mm -hmm. um, that's paramount as well, because if you're not well, you're not going to be well for others. And you certainly can't go to class. You certainly can't do well. You certainly can't go to work and be effective. Um, and that just beyond students. I think it's all of us. We're all in a very difficult unique circumstance um, no matter where you are and what you do life is not the same it used to be um, and it is important that we take that time to take care of ourselves take care of the people around us check in with other people mm -hmm. um, and letting them just making sure they're okay too if best we can um, and um, just take it one day at a time one of the things we we often struggle with is looking too far down the road what's going to happen next year what's going right. to happen next month we can't even determine what's going to happen tomorrow. So uh, it's important to sort of live in the moment, um, appreciate and have gratitude for what you do have and not get caught up in what you want 
for later um, and just living for now, I think is important too. So that's all I, I would recommend. Excellent. Jerry. So my, my two words were, is the youth or three words, use your resources, mm -hmm. uh, both academically and, and, and otherwise throughout the university. You know, I, I, I do some adjunct teaching and if it's the last two weeks of class, you're like, oh, I should get a tutor or I should do X credit. No, we should be thinking about that early in the semester. Use those, use those tutors, use the, use the student support services, TRIO, the writing center, all those type of things, all those resources that are here on campus to help you academically, use those. The, you know, success coaches, whatever they might be, uh, use those resources. You're paying for them. They're, they're part of what we have to offer. So use those resources and also use all the other resources that are you know, not academically. Get involved in activities, you know, go to the events, even their virtual comedians, what virtual game shows this semester. Uh, come, come by our offices. We love to see students. Um, um, so if we can help you in any way, use us, use our resources, go to the centers, um, you know, whether it's a game night or a, a speaker, whatever it is, use all your resources and get the most out of it. That's excellent. That's something I always say to some of my students here at the radio station is I say, you're paying for this. You, you, you're, this is, you're coming out of your wallet or your parents' wallet or whatever. You're paying for these services. Use them, you know, please. So that's excellent. That's uh, You hit that one out of the park, Jerry. Uh, gentlemen, I, I want to thank you so much. Uh, Vice President for Enrollment Management and Student Affairs, Dr. Warren Hilton, uh, Dean of Students, Dr. Donovan McCargo, and Associate Dean for Inclusion and Outreach, Jerry Shearer. Uh, I wish you all a great semester. I mean, we, we had a lot of advice for students, but you guys take care of yourselves too. I mean, because we need you here to, to do your job and to help help all these wonderful students. And uh, we look forward to seeing you around campus this semester.